As an employee experience and culture leader, my discussions often start with a focus on attraction, retention and engagement of um, key talent um, and how to uh, really retain um, the people in the workplace given the current environment. Um, but inevitably our focus turns to how wellbeing is actually hampering retention and engagement and what can be done to reduce the risk of burnout. Um, our Global Talent Trends study, which consists of 14,000 voices across 13 countries, has a really clear sentiment of that this year, um, as compared to other years, employees are feeling quite fatigued. Um, just to throw a statistic in there early, 78% um, of Australians are saying they're at risk of burnout, which is a huge increase from 63% in our pre-pandemic days. Some of the things that I'm seeing predominantly around this energy crisis, I think one of our, our, co our colleagues, Cynthia Cottrell, she talks about this beautifully as a global energy crisis. Um, and she talks about our needing to find these sustainable and renewable sources of energy for our people um, in workplaces and looking at ways in which we can create that job satisfaction and that sense of connection to work, the work that we do, which actually helps us to feel good um, because there are so many great health benefits of work. When we continue to ask more of our people in an environment, especially over the last few years with the pandemic, where people are already, already low on energy in their everyday lives because they're having to respond to constant changes and constant um, shifts in expectations and lockdowns and all the fun things that we've had to navigate, when those energy levels are already low, we don't have not enough left in the tank to then come to work and also be immensely productive and immensely efficient and all of these extra things. The concern is that the top reason that employees are feeling burnout is not being sufficiently rewarded. Mm -hmm. And this is something that keeps cropping up in a conversation when I have with my clients that potentially leaders are not fully understanding uh, the definition of burnout and the sources in which um, you know, burnout occurs. And so they're thinking it's to do with the individual not being able to cope with their work or poor time management. But as you know, uh, the World Health Organization uh, officially um, categorized it as an occupational phenomenon mm -hmm. and not a medical condition. So really okay. is the onus is on the leaders to actually um, you know, put the strategies in place. If we think of well-being for our people as a bucket, right, and we have resources and we have all these beautiful programs and things that we want to give, and we think about us pouring those into the top of the bucket. Now, that's great, and the bucket fills up and people feel good, but there is also a hole at the bottom of that bucket. And that hole, unfortunately, is our employee's sense of health and safety to begin with. Um, and if we, if we don't look at strategies to plug that hole first, we can pull whatever we like in the top. It will just continue to drain out of the bottom. Um, and we won't see that value on investment. We won't see that return on investment from the, the money that we are committing to that space or the programs that we are putting in that space. Because what we're doing is we're creating a situation where employees can't actually tap into those benefits because they're not feeling safe at work. One of the other ways we've been able to be agile in this space too is we have really forged into the micro learning space over the last 12 months. Um, so rather than doing these big four hour or whole day training sessions, what we've started doing is just providing these little brain friendly brain dumps of information that, you know, five, 10 minutes long. People can listen to them, you know, in a break while they're getting a coffee, while they're driving up to see their next client, 
um, you know, going for a walk, they pop them, pop it in as a, a podcast in their ears, and they get this brain friendly dump of information that they can that's practical and that they can apply it straight away in their everyday working life. Um, so that's been really um, intensified over the last 12 months. And we're seeing great responses to that because it's, I don't have time to read a seven page document. I don't have time to sit through a four hour training session, but I do have time to listen to a five minute you know, audio on how to habit stack or how to be more time efficient in my day or, you know, whatever it might be. So, yeah, I think it's opened up a world of opportunity for us. I know that in in the work that I've been doing with employee value propositions and um, employee experience, um, there's more of a focus around a segmented, targeted approach when it comes to unique drivers and motivations across different personas, for example. Mm, yeah. And with over 35% uh, of HR professionals agreeing that a more targeted, segmented approach to their wellbeing strategies and their packages is the way forward for them. This is where data analytics can really play strongly um, to, you know, an organization's planning strat in the strategy piece. Um, looking at your data, so things like your claims experience, looking at grievances, looking at even things like exit interviews and why are people leaving? What are their reasons for leaving? What, what weren't we meeting for this person potentially? Um, looking at things like absenteeism, um, what, you know, what are the rates like? Where are your hotspots? Um, we've recently worked with a client, which was fantastic. It was such an interesting piece. We looked at workers' comp claims data and we looked at salary continuance claims data. And we were able to sort of notice some really specific trends happening around particular groups within the organisation. So, for example, um, one of the highlights was women over 50s in executive level or senior leader level positions um, were, had an increase in breast cancer claims specifically. So the organization was able to be responsive to that and realize that their current well-being offering was actually missing that group of people and that particular um, claims experience. And so in response to that, you know, one of the biggest, I think, issues with that senior leader level is time, having time to go and, you know, do screening and pr they put these preventative measures in place. Um, so they were able to create a program where they were bringing some of these early intervention um, processes into the workplace and fit that in with, you know, senior leaders' days. Leadership is a huge space and opportunity for us to inject some knowledge. It's I was just, I presented at the Psychosocial Risk Conference earlier this week and a big topic was how do we help leaders because there's never been a time in human history where leaders have had so much expectation in terms of what they do. It's not enough just to be a technical expert in their space or in their field anymore. They now almost need to have a degree in psychology to deal with some of the leadership pressures and team pressures that they're seeing in an environment where we're constantly asking more of our people. Um, and I think leadership capability building, not just around technical and soft skill, right? Traditionally, you know, we have moved into this space where we now want to encourage soft skill, but we also need to tie that into things like progression and performance. Um, we need to tie that into encouraging leaders from the minute their boots hit the ground, not, when, not necessarily when they come into the business with the title of leader, but the minute someone hits the ground in an organisation, they need to be encouraged and treated as though one day they will be one. We all have this ability to influence the environment that we're in. Um, we have such an impact, and I think sometimes we underestimate the impact that we have on the people around us. So if we're encouraging that leadership mentality from the minute people get there, we're giving that, that the technical expertise, you know, in terms of professional development, we're building the soft skill set, but then we're also giving them and helping them to understand how they interact, how to have courageous conversations, how to set boundaries, how not to step on people's personal values, those kinds of extra pieces. When they step up into the leadership role, they're ready to go. It's not such a huge skill gap that we need to meet 
to get them leader ready because they've already been on that journey and they're ready to go from the get-go.